about five years ago. Um, in September 2015, um, actually six years ago now, uh, the UN decided to come up with a new roadmap. It's the UN SDGs, you heard about that, right? And we have the political consensus for these 17 goals. We have the scientific evidence for these goals. And we have the technology, how to do it, more or less. But what's missing is the question, how can we finance all that? And Gary, Jacob, CEO of the, and president of WAS, and me and, and a group of, uh, of fellows decided to come up with an initiative trying to answer that question. How can we finance SDGs and how can we finance our common future? So I would go through this argument in four sectors. The first one is I would like to introduce a Western and an Eastern narrative. Second, I would like to introduce the term of the Anthropocene. Third, I will go into the specific argument of the Tao of finance, which basically outlines the necessity to upgrade our financial system and our monetary system. And then I will sum the entire argument. And at the end, I'm happy to discuss further uh, issues with you. <clears throat> What do you think is the selection advantage of the human species? It is not the opposition of the thumb. It is not walking right up. It is not having emotions. It's not the speech and mental processing. It's not living in groups. All these things you will find in other animals. The selection advantage of humans compared to all other species on this planet is that we can tell each other stories about something that actually doesn't even exist in the outer world, like a legal system, like God, like the monetary system. And we tell each other a story about that and, believe, and we trust and believe in all these stories. And this trust and this belief in that narrative can basically coordinate behavioral change of millions and billions of people. And if you look at the Western approach to narratives, the Western approach to storytelling, we in the West, we are very powerful in analytical thinking. Our stories are based on a narrative which is more experimental, which is more causal, which is more, as you say, um, case-based. The Western approach provides significant insight into scientific findings, but the Eastern approach is actually different. The Eastern approach is not so much about finding causal links or experimental findings. It's more about complementarities. It's about understanding the whole of the society, the whole of nature and its interactions. I'm getting back to that. If we consider that we're now living in a new era, and Paul Krusen joined this, uh, coined this in a nature paper in 2002 called the Anthropocene, where first time in world history, humans, are sitting in the driver's seat in order to influence and cause geological and ecological changes directly. You can look at this from a very long perspective. We can look at this kind of the last five seconds of a very, very long story. And this red dot in the middle presents where we are right now. And if you look, 
into the past, the story started, let's say, about 10 or 15,000 years ago, called the Holocene. About two and a half thousand years ago, Kaliaspas called it the Axis time, where rational thinking started. We had in the 16th century the first Renaissance, the first Enlightenment, and the first adaptation described by Charles Darwin. And now we're entering in a phase called the big acceleration where the humans are basically determining the outcome of our planet. And this shift is a shift where we start entering a new form of adaptation, maybe a second form of enlightenment, maybe a second form of renaissance, maybe even a second form of axle time. And this era is called the area of the Anthropocene. And one of the major things in this shift happening is, is a shift in our mindset. If you look closer into this era of the Anthropocene, we are operating within planetary boundaries and we are operating in an era where everything is connected with everything. We have major feedback loops and tipping points and everything which is happening within this era is basically happening in an exponential way. You know, this is a publication from uh, the IPCC a couple of years ago. You know these data and you know these graphs showing that within these seven, eight, or 10 different planetary boundaries, we've exceeded already three climate changes one, the nitrocene cycles is another one, the right of biodiversity is the third one, and there's others where we basically exceed the planetary boundaries. In such a situation, um, we are reaching multiple tipping points where linear thinking, where analytical thinking, where causal thinking is replaced by systemic thinking and integral thinking. In order to better understand these overshots, in order to better understand the complexity of such interactions, we require a different narrative, and we probably also require a different way of dealing with this narrative. The UN SDGs signed in in 2015 with all these 17 goals was the largest UN um, program ever done in order to find out a new map for the future. And as I mentioned in my intro, we have the scientific evidence for each of these goals. We have the political will for each of these goals. And we have the technolo technological know-how how to do it. We know, for example, how to overcome poverty or hunger. Each human needs about 1,500 calories. We know how to set up a hospital and train a nurse. We know how to build a kindergarten and to provide high-end uh, high education. But the question we left out at the UN and the process of the last five years is, how can we finance all that? How can we really enact all these goals within the next 10 to 15 years? And if you look at UN sustainability development solutions, there is a lot of solutions out there. We have to change technology, for example, number two. We introduce geoengineering or renewables. We provide additional sinks. We change our demographic patterns. We change science. But there's one aspect we constantly overlook, and this is the design of the monetary system and the design of the financial system itself. And what we're talking about today, in order to get the figures right, is we're talking about 5 trillion US dollars annually over the next 15 years. 
What you see here is financial assets on the planet about 240 trillion. Our global GDP is about 80 to 85 trillion. The remittance payments are 550 um, uh, uh, billion dollars, etc. So this is the figure. This is the volume you're talking about, which is required roughly over the next 15 years, every year, in order to finance our future. And the question is, what is required is additional liquidity at very high scale and at full speed, which is basically targeted towards SDGs in an intelligent and wise manner, and which differs of what has been done in the past. So this was the task we had in the first place for our working group coming up with the solution to answer that question. And what is interesting is if you ask orthodox and traditional financial officers, experts in finance, central bankers, regulators, ministers, politicians, and you ask them the simple question, okay, we signed in for the SDGs, we need 5 trillion and, we'll, and we need them for the next 15 to 20 years. Where does the money come from? You probably do not get a sufficient answer on that question. Traditionally, what we're doing is we either have to grow 10% every year in order to redistribute that money, which is not compatible with our um, with our planetary boundaries, or it will take us about 100 years in order to finance SDGs. There's data out there who can demonstrate that, for example, if uh, we want to reach the educational standard on the global level we have in OECD countries, it will probably last three generations in order to achieve that. So what is the traditional approach? I would like to ask you two questions we're going to discuss later on, and I will give you the answer later on. What is the common denominator between the US petrodollar system on one side and the Chinese Silk Road? The US petrodollar system installed in the 70s of the last century was basically meant to provide enough energy for the US American um, people. And the Chinese Silk Road on the other side is an international trading system. And despite their look different, they have one thing in common. And the second question I want you to keep in mind is what would happen if an s reed hit Europe and 10% of Europe would be destroyed. How would we, how would we manage such a shock? So the traditional way of looking at such a shock, whether it's an asteroid, whether it's the carbon bubble we're sitting on, whether it's the loss of species or another pandemic awaiting is that this yellow, this yellow um, arrow basically resembles our value chain. On top, you have the central banks and then the commercial banking system and then the real economy. And at the end of this value chain, you're basically taxing or feeing that value chain in order to finance SDGs. And on top of this, we have to manage a lot of damage control. The cost for damage control exceeds by large the amount we are redistributing in order to finance SDGs. And in addition, just keep in mind this gray, this gray box in the left, we have a shadow economy where illicit transactions fraud and corruption feeding into this value chain, stabilizing with this value chain, 
but pulling the entire economy in the wrong direction. So if you ask a traditional uh, macroeconomist at your faculty, how can we finance our SDGs? How can we finance our common future? They will tell you, we either grow 10% every year on a global level and redistribute that money, or we, we re remain within the two or 3% of growth pattern over the next 100 years and do the same. But either way, either way, this story we're telling each other in order to finance our future is not appropriate. Why is financing SDG so difficult? Why is financing asymmetric shocks like pandemics, species losses, or even an asteroid, let's make a fictitious story, so difficult? The entire system we are operating in, the entire financial system, the banking system and the currency system is tremendously unstable. You can measure empirically about 10 events of banking crisis, state failures, state bankruptcies, or currency crisis every year somewhere else on the planet. And this leads to multiple so-called lock-in effects. So whenever there is a crisis, we try to repair the given crisis in order to stabilize the given system without having a real impact on SDGs. If you have the time to look closer to these SDG programs, you will probably recognize that about one third of these SDGs are eligible for private funding, meaning you have, can have a private investor being involved by building a sewage system or a highway or a hospital. But about two thirds of the SDGs are global commons. And global commons require a different financial schema to enable them. And what is interesting, if you look into the literature and into the research finding of commons is that they have an extremely high return on investment. The Copenhagen consensus, which was installed about 10, 15 years ago, um, they tried to come up with measures on what is the return on investment on every dollar we spend on global commons. And global commons have a return on investments, which is by factor 10 or factor 100 higher compared to the amount of money you invest in. So for example, if the world community decides to invest $1 in education, the return is five to seven to even 15, 20 times higher within the next years and decades. So why financing SDGs is so difficult? Finally, it's very difficult because we have a black market, we have illicit transactions and an informal sector, which pulls this value chain I showed you in the previous graph into the wrong direction. This is a graph you know from your textbooks. It describes what sustainability is all about. It basically describes the triangle of ecology, the social world, and the real economy. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with the common denominator between the three. In fact, this picture in fact, this narrative you're telling each other here is inappropriate. We have to look at it from a different perspective. I think if we try to bring in finance and the monetary system into this equation, the picture and the narrative you're telling each other is a different one. 
it's more like it's more like a funnel looked from above where the monetary system is kind of an attractor in the center of it determining the outcome in the real economy of goods and services in our ent entire social world and its impact on our planet. So if we tell each other the wrong story and if we use the wrong frames and we use the wrong pictures, we end up with the wrong solutions. But we can revise this Western narrative on finance. The first thing we have to take into consideration that sustainable finance is not the same than financing sustainability. Sustainable finance simply describes how can we make the financial system more long-term, whereas financing sustainability describes what is required in the financial system in order to finance our future. The second thing is, traditionally, finance drives sustainability, meaning even if we have the brightest ideas about how to come up with a drug against cancer or a vaccine against the next pandemics or money in order to reforest the sub-Sahara. When there is no money, these projects will never be able to happen. It actually should be the other way around. It's not finance drives sustainability, it should be sustainability driving finance. And within our current narrative and orthodox finance, we're always telling us the story that we first have to tax our value chain. We have first have to borrow money from somewhere in order to spend it. This idea of taxing and borrowing before spending is a myth. Money is, money is not a thing. Money and finance is not a natural law. It is probably, as Gary Jacobs writes in the seminal paper for Catmus, you should read that, money is probably one of the most important inventions humans ever did. It can literally translate a bag of sand into a PhD, into a hospital, into housing, into a better future. And it depends on us how we design that financial system in order to make out of weapons of mass destructions, which they have been um, characterized in the 90s and around the millennium, into tools of massive social and ecological investment. And if you look at the entire debate of the last 20, 30 years on finance and sustainability, I've been involved to some extent, you find basically two general approaches. One is we spend our entire money and entire energy and our entire time repairing the given system. We increase regulatory efforts, we increase taxation, and others, or we spend our money and our time and our energy and our wisdom and creating an additional parallel upgrading system that interacts with the given system. And the question we've been asking us in our workshop and our commission is, does that happen already beyond repairing the given system? And what you find empirically, there's three fields in which this paralyzation of the given currency system, of the given financial system, is happening already. 
you find since about 10 years, private initiative on so-called cryptocurrencies, private currency systems like Bitcoin, stable coin initiatives, or the Libra initiative of Facebook, which is now the DM uh, initiative. You find since about 75 years, globally, four or 5,000 initiatives all over the world of so-called re regional currency systems who try to fix local problems by introducing an alternative complementary currency system or since about three to four years, central bankers started to introduce so-called CBDCs, which means central bank digital currency systems. All these three initiatives, central bank digital currency system, about 50, 53 central banks on the planet are basically using this already and trying to introduce a parallel system already. Regional currency systems are happening since 75 years and cryptocurrencies have a market capitalization of about 300 billion already. This kind of parallelization is happening already. And the question we've been asking in our working group is if these trends are happening already, how can we understand these trends and put them in the framework that allows us to really meet our unmet needs and to really hedge our unchecked risks in order to finance our future. If you kind of put the entire debate on the traditional way in one graph, you can see that there is five steps. One is we put all our effort in regulating the system. We harmonize our rules and codes. We increase transparency. We introduce ECG standards or social corporate responsibility standards. The next step is we introduce additional carbon tax, for example, or we subsidize renewables or de-invest in the fossil industry. The third step is basically addressing the private sector where we start encouraging impact funding. The fourth step is we come up with alternative strategies like new hedging instruments, like swaps, derivatives, asset-backed securities in order to hedge our risks. And the fifth step is we start with blended finance. It's basically private, part pub uh, private public partnership programs, which combines the private sector and the public sector. This, these five steps, five steps basically describe the conventional way to do it. And if you combine all these five steps and try to make the best out of it, you will come up with the conclusion, you will very likely come up with the conclusion that these five steps are honored and they're important, but they're not enough to finance our future. There's a sixth step missing. One of our members of the working group uh, was working at um, um, Taxonomy and um, how to evaluate um, Standard & Poor's uh, uh, firms all over the world. And what he found out is about 15 to 20% of the entire greening process can be done within each firm. Meaning if you have a firm out there and say, you have to become greener, you have to become more long-term, you have to become introducing ESG standards, about 20% of the entire process can be done within the value chain, chain um, upstream and downstream. But after these 20%, 
the firm, if he wants to introduce more of sustainability, basically has to quit the market, which means 20% can be done on a corporate level. The other 80% depends on a systems change, meaning we have to change the incentives, allowing us to shift the entire firm, the entire economy, our entire society towards a greener future. So what's missing in this six pack is from our perspective, not repairing the given system and not introducing another tax and not enhancing private public partnership, but rather introducing a parallel currency system, allowing us to shift from the fossil industry towards a green marketplace. So can we do that differently? Remember I showed you that graph in the first place with the value chain, the orange value chain and the SDGs? So can we do it differently? Can we introduce a parallel system? And this is happening already. And why, why is such a dual digital currency system in favor of our common future? If you look at this graph, you see this green big arrow that introducing such a parallel system is not redistributing money. It's basically pre-distributive. It provides the society with additional liquidity in order to finance our future. Second, it provides targeted liquidity. Targeted liquidity means we're using third and fourth generation blockchain technology, which allows us to directly target our SDGs with a smart contract. And having such a dual digital currency system in place, we suddenly create multiple positive feedback loops for the entire system. And we end up in a world where the monetary monopoly is basically replaced by a monetary ecosystem. And we end up in a world where we start honoring the complexity and the uncertainty we are facing in the age of the Anthropocene. In our report, we could show that introducing such a dual currency system, we basically end up in a new form of equilibrium economists called Pareto superior. So this is the traditional way, and this would be the full picture. You know, from a if you if you if you use a narrative, you would say we start riding a bike with two wheels instead of a unicycle. This makes the entire system more stable, more predictable. And we start really financing our future by introducing a new currency system. I'm not going to go with you through this graph, but we were able to identify about 30, 33 impacts of such a dual system where we then start replacing these weapons of mass destructions, as they're sometimes called these financial engineerings, into tools of massive social environmental invention. A dual currency system will overcome illicit transactions and shadow economy, number nine. It will cause number 25, tremendous positive distributive effects with regard to poverty and hunger, okay? We will start entering a world where we don't create only windfall revenues, 29, but create multiple so-called second round effects. Just imagine if we stayed in a monetary monoculture, 
and we would invent uh, windmills or renewables, upstream and downstream the value chain, everything would stay the same. In a dual currency system, we would start creating multiple second round effects. Each time you use this green dollar, each time we use this green currency, we would basically create one step closer to a common green future. I give you one example. We've created about several hundreds of them. And in fact, there are several thousands of them of permutations possible if we start introducing a parallel system. Look, this is, a, this is the, the conventional way to do it. The central bank is providing money for the commercial banking system and the commercial banking system hands out a loan to let's say a pork farm. And the pork farm is taxed. And with this tax money, we basically create a preschooling, a kindergarten. The pork farm itself has several negative spillovers, which is subsidized and creates negative externalities, ecological and social externalities, for example, with regard to water and health and CO2 with a negative impact on our community. On the other side, with this tax money, where we create a nursing home for, for kids, this creates positive spillovers on wealth, on health, environment. It reduces birth rate, et cetera, et cetera. This is the conventional way to do it. But we can do that differently. This is shown in the next slide. The same central bank in place provides a loan to, to the commercial banking system. And the commercial banking system decides to hand out a loan to a pork farm. And the pork farm still has to <clears throat> create its porks, but creates negative spillovers to the community. But the central bank at the same time funds preschooling to a multilateral developing band, creating positive spillovers. We start separating the private from the public sector. We are separating the revenues from the private and the public sector. And we start funding our commons. We start funding our, um, our global commons in a different way. So at the beginning of my intro, I ask you two questions. What is the common denominator between the US petrodollar system and the Chinese Silk Road? Despite their different projects, the common denominator is the money system. Be aware, just be aware, whether it's the Yuan Renminbi for the Chinese or the US dollar system, in both cases, we have countries with a convertible currency rate, a currency system, with a convertible currency. And if the US government decides to create a petrodollar system with the Middle East, they call up the Fed and say, we need so and so many trillion US dollars. And the Fed provides that liquidity to the Ministry for Trading or Energy, and the Ministry for Trading and Energy takes that money and issues projects for the commercial banking system and the real economy to find that petrodollar system. There's nobody taxed in the US to fund the petrodollar system. The same is true for the Chinese Silk Road. The Chinese Bank of, uh, People's Bank of China, is creating the UN, the Yuan and the Renminbi out of its own in order to fund, for example, an airport in Myanmar along the Silk Road all the way to Europe. They're not taxing the citizens to do so. Second, what would happen if an asteroid hit Europe and 10% are destroyed. You can replace this picture of the asteroid by the pandemic. 
you can replace it by the loss of species, or you can replace it by the SDGs or the carbon bubble. Let's say Europe has, has been hit by an asteroid and 10% are more or less destroyed. Would we really tax the 90% in order to fund and rebuild the 10%? We would never do that. We would generate additional liquidity to finance the 10% beyond taxing the 90%. This is why we are in favor of a more holistic approach in finance, which differentiates between the public and the private purse, the fiscal and monetary policy. And such a dual monetary system has about a dozen of such positive impacts on our common future. Let me summarize the next two minutes. I think when we're talking about the future and the entire sustainability debate, we are always good in debating and discussing technology. We're good in debating uh, uh, policy for demographic changes. We're good in debating lifestyle changes like becoming a, becoming a vegetarian or riding a bike. But we've overlooked the impact of the monetary and financial system in this entire equation. And this requires more of a change in our mindset than a change in technology. And if you look at the real tragedy of the commons, the real tragedy of the commons is not that they're misused or neglected, because you know, fresh air will always stay fresh air. And attending uh, a kindergarten or accessing a healthcare system will always stay the same. The real tragedy of the commons is they have to run within a monetary system, within a financial system that favors private revenues and underfunds the commons. You know, psychologically, and I say that as a shrink from Germany, we are trapped in by the idea that there is just only one monetary system in place, providing a single specific liquidity for all purposes. And we assume that the allocative distribution through that monetary culture is the most efficient and effective way to do it. In order to change that, we have to change our mindset. And we can do that technically in less than 18 months and with less than 200 people staff to make that happen. The real tragedy of the commons is not their overuse or free rider as you learn in your textbooks as fresh water and clean air or kindergarten will remain always fresh air, clean air or kindergarten. The real tragedy of the commons is the underlying financial system or incentive allowing to enable fresh air, clean air, uh, fresh water, clean air, or a kindergarten. This is why we called our initiative uh, the Tao Finance Initiative, because it's more an Eastern narrative, not a Western narrative. It's not only experimental, linear, causal, analytical thinking. It's more holistic. It's more complementary. And Tao in Taoism describes the best practice, the best way to do it. And the Tao finance is best described as introducing a dual currency system. This was the initiative of the last five years. We have um, uh, multiple study papers out there and uh, our book, Financing uh, Our Future is now available on Amazon. We are currently organizing roadshows on a domestic level and I'm starting in the Ukraine in October and then I'm going to Iran and other countries. 
And if you're interested in uh, supporting us, um, please contact us. And I'm happy to discuss this initiative more in details now with you. Thank you very much.